Happy Sunday, and welcome to another episode of His Generation Podcast. This is number two in a three-part series of the basic church operations. These are the essentials that I see as far as what it takes to operate a church and why we go to church and church, 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 all those beautiful things that we understand about it. Uh, Today is going to be the number two, and it's the essential purposes of the gathering, and I added this, and worship, because that's something we need to understand too. So welcome to another episode of His Generation Podcast. You're listening to His Generation Podcast, a weekly exploration into biblical truth as we explore the Word of God. His Generation Podcast airs every Sunday morning. So grab your Bible, and here we go. Like I said previously, that this is number two in a three-part series about the basic essentials of our church. Now, I have three main scriptures that we're going to be looking at, and I'll show a little bit how they are connected together. Now, when it comes to this topic of what is called, uh, let's just give it the theological term of ecclesiology, uh, there's many passages that we use for principles and precedent. But for the purpose of this smaller setting and this uh, time-limited setting, uh, I'm going to be basically using three passages that we gather or the, we find reasons to gather on a, on a often or weekly basis. Now, the first verse is going to be Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. And that verse says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, as is in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's the first verse that we're going to be looking at as we start to unpack the reason or the essential purposes of our gathering. Another verse that I want to look at is going to be Revelation chapter 1, and this is the verses 12 through 20. You have there John the Apostle speaking, and he said, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one, like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. And write these things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And this is where he gives the understanding of the seven uh, lampstands. He said, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So we gather from this verse that Christ is, is in the midst of the seven lampstands, or I should say, in the midst of these seven churches, which we gather the precedent that when we are gathered, Christ is there in the midst of the churches, plural. Next is Psalm 22, and this is a, a, this is a verse that is often overlooked. Uh, it, it's Psalm 22, verse 22 through 23, that declares that Christ is there in the midst of us praising as we are praising. <laughs> it's, it's kind of this, uh, this kind of a weird abstract thing, like we are there to give worship, praise worship uh, specifically, to Christ our Lord, but then he is there in the midst of us as our elder brother, and let's just call him that in this, in this context, uh, they're worshiping with us. That's a very interesting way to think about it, but that's what is happening there. 
And according to Psalm 22, verses 22, 23, it says there, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. And why we interpret it that way is because uh, the writer of Hebrews actually used this quote when building his argument for some of the uh, reasoning of why it is important for us to gather. And he starts it in Hebrews 2, picks it up later in Hebrews 10, and then in Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 13 kind of builds more of this, this uh, what I said before, this like ecclesiology or this uh, purpose of and study of why we gather as a church. And so those are the three main verses that I'm going to be unpacking today as we look and, and think through some of the things of like the essential purposes of our gathering and our worship. Now, all these verses are great, and all these verses have great precedent for us to develop why we gather. But they are nothing, or I shouldn't say that, they do not have a great impact unless, first and foremost, you see those things with an overlay. And that overlay that I'm talking about is the idea of the new covenant. Because along with the writer of Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, like I said, you have the Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 10, chapter 12, and chapter 13, kind of building your ecclesiology or your purpose of the church. Uh, he, he quotes Jeremiah 31, which is the new covenant that was prophesied about, which the Messiah was to, re, to not only reveal, but also fulfill in his person and work. And so the last passage that I think we need to be reminded of, because it's important for us to give us an overlay of, as we look into all these things, because without the understanding and the importance of the new covenant, a lot of the passages that we use for precedent and principle of why we gather, they, they are less impacting. So with the overlay of the new covenant, there's a strong impact of going, wow, these things are important. This is what the, this is what Christ our Lord has given us so that we would appropriately and often come to him as an assembly, as a church, to give him praise and worship. So we need to keep in mind those things. So in Jeremiah 31, uh, specifically verses 31 through 34, we have this. And this is a passage that can be repeated throughout the different uh, moments of the New Testament. Also, too, I would say even through the Old Testament, you'll have uh, hints and you'll have uh, parallel passages that speak of the same new covenant work that the person and work of Christ is going to do. So it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the, in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So this was the promise that he gave to his people to tell them when Messiah comes, this finality or this, this marvelous work would be completed in, in, in his, his operation. Let's just call it that. And that work is what? That the house of Israel, the house of Judah, there would be reconciliation, right? We see that especially in the book of Acts where we see, uh, you know, those, those in Samaria and those in uh, Judea uh, and how the, the gospel brought those two together as brethren. So we see that happening. Also, too, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts now, this is a manifestation of the person and work of the Holy Spirit, right? Because that is a supernatural work where we see later on in Ezekiel, a parallel passage where we see in Ezekiel with the dry bones prophecy, 
of this idea of a of, of God speaking forth and bringing new life to something that is dead. And so the person and work of the Holy Spirit regenerates the dead the dead person and gives them the spirit of God in them, bringing them to life. And we see that in many uh, incidents uh, there in the New Testament and also part of the Apostles' Doctrine. So those things are all what have happened. And so when we gather together, it's important that we remember those things because without the, like I said, the overlay of the new covenant, when we start to break down the nuances or the essentials of what it looks like when we gather, without that understanding, without seeing that fulfillment in the person and work of Christ, we can soon get off track and see church as just a building that we practice good moral things to one another, (laughs) right? And that's all we'll see it as. Or we will not see the pastoral role as anything important. We won't see the, the, the teaching of the word as anything important. And we will misstep when it comes to our musical praise. All those things are even our attendance. We won't see those things as important. So we need the new covenant overlay. And like I said, This is not my innovative argument whatsoever. This is simply what the writer of Hebrews was utilizing where where he gives us a lot of this understanding of what it means to gather with one another and the importance of it. All right, so all I'm doing is just piggybacking on that. And later on, we'll see in, uh, in Paul's letters, his epistles, he does pretty much the same thing. Because the first thing that I want to add to our conversation here when it comes to the essential purposes of the gathering and worship is communion. Because sometimes I've seen in churches, we overlook communion uh, and we we treat it as like a, a kind of like a secondary thing to things like, for instance, our musical worship or our reading of the scriptures and teaching of the scriptures, where I would argue uh, because of the importance that we see not only in the um, uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul's corrections to the church in 1 Corinthians, which I, I'll show you 1 Corinthians 11 in a second here, but also, too, I would argue because of the mention of Christ at the Last Supper and the significance of him speaking specifically of communion related to the New Covenant, where he specifically quotes the New Covenant, right? Um, I would say it is as equal importance when we do gather together. Uh, in the Reformed tradition, they call it a means of grace. In some churches from Catholicism all the way to different Protestant uh, movements, we'll call it a sacrament. Uh, both of those terms in their theological thought are, are very serious, are very um, very prominent things. And so you need to, that's why the idea of sacrament is a very important word. So we see there, and we learn from Paul the Apostle as he's correcting the Corinthian church there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 through 30. He has some choice words to say to them, but through those choice words of correction, we can gather precedent and principle and understanding of what not only our gathering should, should look like in motive and intent, but also, too, kind of a, a frequency of our gathering. And then lastly, the understanding of uh, what he calls the Lord's Supper, what we to, we today might call it Lord's Supper, or we might call it communion. He says to the Corinthian church, first of all, when you come together as a church, so there's our first piece of textual evidence, uh, they were gathering together as a church, right? Now, as far as the frequency of that, we will unpack that a little bit later as we get into today's presentation, but I just want to point that out because we're going to re-reference that at some point later on. It says, first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be fractions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So what he's basically saying to them is because of your intent or because of your Uh, maybe um, divisiveness within the church, you're not gathering in the right, in the right purpose. Because again, going back to that new covenant overlay, the one of the work of Christ 
in the new covenant was to bring reconciliation to divided brethren. So as, if we as brethren start to divide, <laughs> we work very opposite or in opposition of what this new covenant's about. Do you see that? But if you didn't see that, then this would just be something a little bit less. And that's the purpose why I want to point that out. So he says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? So there he physically identifies the gathering as the church of God, right? So again, another piece of evidence. Uh, What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And then he goes, that's the correction. And then he goes into the instruction. He says, for I received from the Lord that day, which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat. This is the body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same matter, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Again, the covenant, new covenant lens or overlay is brought into this because it's important. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And then what's interesting, he goes on to this last part here and he says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. So for the physical warning, notice how he says there, for many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. In other words, some people are actually dying. That's many sleep is a, a, a very like soft way of saying those that are in the Lord when they do die, right? Because there, it's not this death for eternity, but it's this death from passing on to uh, the physical life and to the eternal life. So he usually describes in his epistles the idea of death as sleep. Now, but the warning is still there. So if there is a warning there, we have to infer that the Lord's Supper or communion has high importance, right? And so that's part of this discerning the Lord's body. You need to infer that it's not just a meal or I can cut line. (laughs) I don't have to think of anyone but myself. I gather as much bread or much food as I want to, and I drink as much as the cup as I want to. Uh, No, it's it's for the purpose. It's ceremonial. It's for to, to be a a reflection of not only remembering the sacrifice that the Lord did as he fulfilled the new covenant with the blood of his sacrifice, but also, too, that that new covenant work is there to bring reconciliation. And so those things are important when we do gather in the church. So what can we gather some principle from this? Some principle is that when we gather, it's for the purpose of being one. For when we gather, we should do things that are important, for instance, like the Lord's Supper, with a proper understanding of the importance of it, with the overlay of the new covenant. Now, now that I covered that, I want to look at one more thing before we pass up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to look at the often parts of that, because that's going to be important. That's going to play into our frequency of gathering. Because like I said before, I have personally witnessed in churches where they hold the teaching time and they hold the uh, musical praise time more important than they would hold like the Lord's Supper or communion time. But now I am arguing, arguing for the purpose of saying those things should all be equally important and an essential when we do gather. Now, the amount of time that we, or the frequency that we gather we don't yet know from this passage, but we can grab some precedent because that is a very debatable subject within Christian scholarship. 
So this is a major passage when it comes to that argument, because what we can gather from this is, yes, they did come together, and yes, they did it often. So those two things are essential when it comes to the gathering of one another. We need to come together physically as a church, and we need to be often. Those things are essential. Without those things, we neglect these means of grace. Let's just call them that to use the theological phrase. These means of grace that are there to not only um, strengthen our faith, but also there to uh, edify our love for one another. Very important things to the body of Christ. True? True. All right, so we have that. Now, we can continue to build this idea and, uh, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll use this phrase often, you know, precedent and principle, because a lot of these scriptures are going to be very direct. A lot of these scriptures you will see and be like, oh, yeah, no, I get it. It's, it's clear that it's an imperative. It says it there. I command or the Lord commands. And you see those things. Uh, but then, you know, other scriptures, you'll just you'll we, we gather what's called principle or precedent. In other words, we can use it to build kind of a direction that we think is the 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 best practice of our faith, or our, in this case, our gathering together. So I have another two scriptures that I want to cover, and this is when we gather the idea of presenting ourselves to the King of King and Lord of Lords. So it's an, uh, this is an essential purpose of why we gather, is because we are presenting ourselves to Christ our Lord. And there's two passages that are very important to this. Going back to the Psalm 22, we see a passage there. And remember, this is in context of the, the previous uh, part of the psalm, speaking how Christ is there in the midst of us, worshiping uh, as our elder brother, right? So you have another part of Psalm 22. This is verses 27 through 28. It says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. So in this, we see here, in when it says the ends of the world, it's talking about both Jew and Gentile. So you see with all nations, because it says Christ is the Lord, right, over all nations. He rules over like a king, a king, a lord of lords. He rules over all nations. And so when we worship, we bring our family, right, we bring the family of God, and I would say also, too, we can use a pre principle and precedent to say that we bring our households to assemble before the Lord in our gathering. So we're presenting ourselves before a king. We are subject to the king. One thing that our society did get right when it comes to the monarchy <laughs> uh, model of government is that there is an idea that the monarch owns everything and that the people are subject to that monarch because we see it there in the heavenly uh, uh, position of Jesus Christ being Lord of Lord, King of Kings, his people being subject to him and his demanding or his instructing of them to gather before him as in, you know, the sense of subject gathering for the king. Because also, too, we see in Hebrews uh, 12, verses 22 to 24, uh, the author grabbing that same idea. And him speaking more of the Old Testament model, but obviously because he's speaking in the place of Christ post-resurrection and the work of Messiah being completed, he says this to his audience in Hebrews chapter 12, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, so not the physical Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. He's thinking more in abstract terms using the Old Testament is types and shadows, and he does that a lot. He even talks about what types and shadows are as far as definition in the book of Hebrews. And he says, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly, there's some of our ecclesiology, and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just man made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, right? There we get that term, that overlay again. And to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So showing that the blood of Christ or the sacrifice of Christ 
was a type and shadow of Abel's righteous blood being spilt, right? And so there's life-giving quality within that blood. But in Christ, it's more than just life-giving quality. It's redemption and atonement. That's the, that's, that's the price that was paid for the forgiveness of my sin and your sin in this work of the new covenant. So we, the general assembly, gather together, the church specifically, before the Lord, right? And also what's interesting about this verse, and, you know, I'm not going to unpack it too much here, but this is the verse a lot of times when church, churches decide to do some kind of like official membership, you know, where they say, uh, you know, if you're one that is going to hold this as your home church, you're going to be giving it to it. You're going to be submitting to the pastoral leadership here. Um, you know, then, then, you know, let's do a formal membership so we can, uh, you know, look after you. And at the same time, you can rely on us 100% as your pastoral support to do these things in the gathering. So they usually grab this verse for that because you do see, like it says, figuratively talking about a register in heaven of the church. Interesting thing. Um, won't unpack it here, but this is the verse that they will use that for. But what I do want to utilize as a principle and precedent, precedent is the idea that we gather together, we present ourselves to the king. Now, the next one, as far as essentials, is the reading and instruction of scriptures. So when in episode uh, number one of this three-part series, I talked a little bit about the essentials of the pastoral role, and this is piggybacking on that because the, the reading and the instruction of scriptures, I would argue, are going to be a manifestation of the gifting of the offices for the church. We talked about that a little bit in Ephesians chapter 4, where where Christ gives gifts to the church in, in the form of the apostles, the prophets, the preacher, or the pastor, teacher, and the evangelist. For what? For the edification and the growing and the maturing and the loving of the saints. So Paul, carrying that idea in 2 Timothy uh, chapters 3 and 4, gives a little bit of insight of that role of Timothy, who we can definitely argue was the elder or at least the pastor at these churches that, that Paul left him, um, left in his care as Paul departed. And he gives him a strong exhortation when it comes to the scriptures and the application to the congregation as the pastor elder. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction for instruction in righteousness, which is, which is important, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And like I argued before, it's very much a similar language of the Ephesians chapter 4 um, qualifications and purpose of the pastor teacher. He says there, preach the word, and that's an imperative. He's commanding him, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So that's that's what the the pastor elder is doing, is they are using the scriptures to convince, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. And be turned aside to fables. So what I like about this, when he speaks to Timothy, he doesn't use any inference. He directly tells them, because a lot of times you'll see within the corrections of Paul the Apostle, he uses a lot of inference. Um, if you don't do this, it's going to infer that this is going to happen to you. Where here he says, if you don't do these things, like <laughs> you need to be preaching the word that's convincing, rebuking, exhorting, with all long suffering and teaching, and if you don't do those things, there will come a time when they're not going to endure sound doctrine and they're going to go after teachers teaching them falsities that take them away from this truth, this instruction and in righteousness. And so it's a very direct message. So a high importance in our gathering is the reading and instruction of scriptures because that's, that's the part that's going to strengthen our mind Obviously, it will strengthen our faith, but it will keep us on track to be able to grow into maturity, like the author of Hebrews says, 
for the purpose to discern good and evil, right? Good and evil. How do we discern that? We are going to do that through the maturity of learning the scriptures, <laughs> right? And that's the role that the pastor has at the church. And that's his participation when it comes to the reading and instruction of the scriptures. Very clear, very clear. I love that passage. Now, speaking of the role of the pastor, I want to make mention of this as we start to wrap up these essential purposes of the gathering and worship. The role of the pastor I talked a lot about in the first episode, but I want to add one more principle as we go into this second part, because we need that we need a pastor or a group of elders and pastors at a church. You cannot have a church without that. It's not just the the congregant members, right? It is the gifts that God gives the church for the purpose of edification and love. And that falls on the office of the pastor teacher. So with that, there is also a financial responsibility that the pastor teacher or the office at the church gets because you, you, you want someone that's going to be in there in kind of a full-time capacity. And so to have that church, you need to have finances. And you're, you're, there's going to be two purposes for those finances. The first purpose is going to be to pay for your, your, your pastor elders, that they have a living to give to you the scriptures, because, and I'll, and I'll give you some of the, the passages that Paul tells us, but because they are giving you spiritual things, the material things that you have, should be open to them. You see how that it works? Now, the other purpose of the financial obligations is to have like a benevolent, benevolence fund or some money that you're giving to the first and foremost, the poorer members in the church, and then also too looking for those charitable things outside of the church. And that's where we find our deacons and them holding that office because they're going to be the ones that are going to be overseeing those and managing those aspects. Churches need financial obligation and the financial position or financial principles we gather from those, we're going to find also in Paul's example. So the first passage that I want to talk about is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is what I deemed uh, best practice because when it comes to financially providing for the pastor, elder, um, this, is the, this is the best practice. And Paul breaks a really clear argument, uh, very direct in this case here, and this is what he says. Apparently, because the Corinthian church had a little bit of an issue of giving of their material goods to um, Paul the Apostle and those that he would bring on staff. It says there, whoever goes to war at his own expense, question mark, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, question mark, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say also, speaking of the Torah, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about, or does he say it altogether for our sake? Well, of course, this is rhetoric, and he's the, the, the passage is for the purpose to understand that you know, there's some natural order that God puts into things, and you just need to let those natural order of things go. For instance, if you, as a as a owner of cattle, have an ox, <laughs> and you're using it to, you know, cut out your, your lines in your field for growing season, if it eats something off the ground while it's treading, that's fine. Were you going to stop it? No, you let it eat some of the, the grain that you're actually going to either plow or you're either going to plant. And for our sakes, Paul says this, no doubt this is written that he who plows should plow in hope and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, it is a great thing if we reap your material things. Do you not know those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And in other words, he's giving another Old Testament example, and those who serve the altar partake in the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So that's your best practice. That's what is the principle and precedent, and I would say even in this case, the command of the Lord. 
So if you are not paying for, if you do not look to manage your church finances for the purpose of to uh, allow the the pastor elder to live off of them, then you're not holding an essential purpose of the gathering. Pretty simple, pretty clear. However, I'm going to put a little bit of responsibility on the the pastor elder too, because that although that's best practice, we do have from the example of Paul the Apostle, Apostle better practice. Let me say that again. From the example of Paul the Apostle, better practice. In Acts chapter twenty, verses twenty five to thirty five, he says this, which I which I find kind kind of interesting. He says, and indeed, no, I know that. You all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I have, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Paul the Apostle, with his one last speeches to the the church elders, right? These are the church elders he's speaking to. In Ephesus, he tells them, first and foremost, he lived in his example through his preaching of the kingdom of God, but also, too, in the time that he was with them, he didn't hold one back of peace of, get, of counsel from God. And at the same time, he never did any coveting of what they had or what the people had there when it comes to the material goods. In fact, he worked with his own hands not only to provide for himself, but also those that were traveling with him. And so he's telling them, use this as an example to support the weak. Because, for instance, there could be a church where, let's say, the finances aren't all there because, um, you know, it just, you don't live in that kind of social, economical achievement area, right? And so the better practice in that case is to work and provide for your own as an elder pastor. Because ultimately, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It is a blessing to receive, but if we're going to talk about a bigger blessing, the bigger blessing is to give according to the words of the Lord. So you have best practice and better practice. Better practice is for the society that doesn't have the money to provide. Best practice is for society that does have the money to provide. (laughs) See how it works? And that's it. But that is an essential financial responsibility of the gathering of one another. There it is. So as far as for our short sake of of time here, uh, I just wanted to kind of conclude with those thoughts when it comes to the essential purposes. Um, I just want also to add this that I didn't mention in the very beginning, but I did kind of talk about it a little bit. But when we say worship, gathering and worship, I want to also put a thought in our mind. You know, this is, I, I like to take these these times to, to speak and also kind of tell you the do nots, right? I'm telling you some of the practices, but I'm also saying these are the do nots. <laughs> do not do these things. Uh, the worship is not just musical. So when we use that term worship, I don't want us to always think, oh, hey, this is just the musical portion. This is just the praise portion. Well, worship is is a broader term that we used as far as like the practice of what we do when we do gather, right? Worshiping the Lord isn't just the praise, but worshiping the Lord is also too, you know, the reading of God's word. You know, we exalt the person and work of Christ as we look at the scriptures and how they point to him and how he is our Lord and he is our savior. And so there's always going to be this exaltation of the person and work of Christ through the reading of scriptures. And also too, like we just covered right here is the giving. You know, we do come in with, uh, f- with finances because, you know, part of our, our responsibility as people in the Lord is to work hard. Uh, that, that was given to us in the beginning, even before we fell in sin was to work hard. And so we are to be a people group that is working hard. And so with that, we are going to have 
financial and material gain. And so we should look to use that financial material gain first and foremost as we gather to support the pastoral staff. And then outward, then also to to provide for one another's needs within the church. And then lastly, to have charitable givings outside of the church. That's kind of the basic structure. Now, lastly, uh, when it comes to this idea of worship, is the time and the location. So the time and location are a little bit debatable. Some of them are this idea of like, we have liberty to practice these things. And we, and some of them is this idea of like, you know, just being wise and, and how we spend our time or, or, or uh, where, we, where we worship and stuff like that. And what I mean by that is first and foremost, in our biblical precedent and principles, like I said before, there is debate about as far as the idea of gathering and the frequency of it, right? Uh, we see scriptures like we looked at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We see this idea of come together as a church and also often. So we understand that, that the New Testament church did come together to gather as a church, right, as an assembly, and that they did it often. Now, when they did it, like I said, there's debate to that. Uh, because we do have a biblical model of six days and on the seventh day we Sabbath, right? All of God's people, that's, that's, a, um, that's a precedent that's set forth all the way until eternity, right? So there is six days and then a Sabbath. Uh, because of that, a lot of times the church tradition uh, carries on to this idea of like the seventh day is the day that the Lord uh, rose from the dead, which is an essential part, especially, like I said, if we have that new covenant overlay, that's going to be an essential part of when the Lord raised. So when the Lord raised is going to be the identity marker of like when we should gather. That, at least that's the tradition. We see there in the book of Revelation, like we talked about in Revelation 1, um, the first part of that where John on the island of Patmos uh, saw the Lord. He says he saw the Lord on the Lord's day when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I'll show you the passage there. It says it in uh, first, uh, the first chapter of Revelation, uh, verses 9 through 11. It says there, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and, pr- and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island of Patmos uh, for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we see there that John calls a specific day the Lord's day, and that he was there in spirit, probably maybe praying or whatever, and this is when Christ appeared to him in this uh, vision here on the island of Patmos. So we have that idea of the Lord's Day, and because it's John the Apostle, this is, um, I don't hear this too often as far as the scholarly approach to this, but just in my own biblical study, I've come to see this, uh, probably the reason why uh, we would call it the gathering the Lord's Day, and also too why we would re- relate it to the day the Lord resurrected, and that should be the tradition of our gathering on that day, which falls on Sunday. Some would argue it falls on the Sabbath. And I would say, well, I think it falls on Sunday. I think on the Sabbath is when, when the Lord was laid in the tomb and then he resurrected the day after. Because we see there, uh, for instance, the apostles in mourning on, when the Lord died, and, but they didn't go out until sunup. And then in sunup, they went to go check on the body, right? So that had to have been the day after Sabbath. So I believe that the reason why tradition would hold a Sunday as the day to meet is be probably because of our verses that we get um, from the, what, uh, I think it's Matthew 17, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, this John that we see in the book of Revelation, and took them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And we see there some specific language 
and specific allusions to the Old Testament that would lead one to believe that that's a very marked out day. And I would say this, this is my opinion, I would say that's probably why the early church utilized a Sunday as their day to meet weekly. So we see there in Matthew, I'll I'll turn up to the screen here, we see there in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, we see some specific language in Matthew's account of the Mount of Transfiguration. We see there it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. So six days is specific. Why would he say six days? In fact, Mark says six days also too in his um, account of this also. So I think the reason why they say six days is because they're trying to say on the seventh day or on the Sabbath, right? Because they wouldn't count six days being Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and, the, and Sunday would be the sixth day. You know, they <laughs> six day is the sixth, the, the sixth day, right? Is going to be then a Sabbath day. Is that what I'm saying? So I think there's some specific language in there that would lead us to believe that this is why they would, on a seventh day, not only because of the Sabbath, but also to relate um, the tradition of meeting on the seventh day, according to when Jesus rose from the dead. I'll tell you why. Okay, so it sounds a little confusing, but let me get into this. (laughs) Uh, It says there, uh, Jesus led them up to, and he was transfigured in this mountain before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So again, this is a a biblical allusion to Exodus 24, 16, where Moses was on Mount Sinai. And it says there too, on the sixth day, um, there was a cloud uh, on this mountain, but on the seventh day, God revealed himself to Moses. So it's very similar language that you see there on our Exodus 24, 16. And it says there, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, Is it good for us to be here? If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So there's this idea of like, let us make a place of worship for you. And while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So there is the, the, the switch in their minds of the uh, authority, let's just call it that, where now Jesus is not just this prophet type to them, but he is actually the son of God who has equal authority with God. So if you hear God, you will hear him. And that's heavy. But let's see what Jesus tells them. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid, of course, But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. So there's the first thing that he says to them. So God the Son says, Arise, do not be afraid. When then he had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only, which is, there's your your very like um, physical, figurative transfer of like perspective that God the Son is equal to God the Father. Yet God the Son is the person that is leading them at this point. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them. Again, here's the words. Hear what Jesus says, according to God the Father. Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Right? Son of Man is risen from the dead. So I believe I have an opinion, let's just call it that, that this is how the tradition started. Because the day that Jesus resurrected, I think the early church marked that as the meeting day rather than the old school meet on the traditional Sabbath day. Okay? And you can argue that. You can go, hey, that's fui balui. <laughs> but I think that's probably how the tradition got started. So, nevertheless, the early church did meet, I would say, on a weekly basis, which would qualify the command that we get from scriptures of meeting often, right? They were to meet often. They just didn't give the date. 
but we can get plenty of pre- precedent and plenty of scriptures like this that, and also to our traditional writings that can lead us to believe it was on the day that Christ resurrected, which would be that Sunday, right? That Sunday. And so that it was a transfer from the Sabbath being a Saturday, uh, uh, Hebrew tradition now to Sunday, which is the early church tradition. There it is. Take it for what you have. But <laughs> uh, one thing we do understand too is we don't want to get a misconception on our location. At least we can say that one thing, because in all these incidents where you see them gathered, there was multiple places where they gathered. The building was just the convenience or the luxury, but them gathering was the importance. Because you see, for instance. Uh, Paul at times uh, when he was in, I think, um, I forget what, what church it might have been, um, the early Corinthian church, I think there's where he met Lydia and he saw Lydia and others gathering at the shore of like the little river or creek or whatever it was ever in that area. So they were gathering outside. And then you see them at times in our New Testament models gathering at a house and then you see them at times gathering at more of a specific building. So where we gather on the Lord's day is not important as far as <laughs> the, lo- the location or the, the construction of that location. But we, we do gather. So if, here's the, here's the do not, if you are a church and you want to buy this building or this cathedral or this all this other stuff and put all your finances wrapped into that, I would say, first and foremost, if your finances aren't providing for the, um, the pastoral leadership, secondly, they aren't providing for the poor in the congregation, and thirdly, if, they don't, if you don't have some kind of means of charitable giving to uh, those outside of the church, you need to have those things in place first before you even decide to, like, let's build this massive construction. <laughs> that should never be, that should be, like, fourth on your list when it comes to the finances of the church. So location could be anywhere is what I'm saying. It doesn't need to be uh, this. It could be a home. It can be outside. It could be in a building. It could be in a building purchased. It could be in a building rented. It could be wherever. That's not important. That's what I want you to understand. It's not an essential. (laughs) It's not an essential. We gathering together is an essential. The place, not an essential. Also, too, church programs. These are things that we have liberty to do. So you can have a men's ministry, a women's ministry, a high school ministry, a, a you know young people's ministry, young adults ministry. You have all these different ministries, but they're not necessary. It's not an essential. There's only one ministry, and that's the gathering to worship. And that's it. That's it. The ministries of the pastors and the offices of the church will happen within that moment, but that's it. So church programs, you have liberty to do those things, but if your essentials aren't covered and managed well, I would never go into operating more church programs. And also, too, lastly, this is the big one, and this is going to be the segue to episode three of our three-part series, partiality. Because within the church, there needs to be a, a high awareness of the practice of brotherly love. And when we start to bring forth partiality, um, you ruin that gathering together. So for instance, Paul the Apostle in chapter 11 talks about that partiality where, you know, those that maybe were more esteemed within society had a little bit more money. uh, They would go and eat the food. And then those that were maybe of a poor stature and in the economical status, they would eat last. (laughs) And so there's your partiality. It was ruining what was to be a strengthening of faith and a brotherly love. Also, too, you see there in James, where he gives an exhortation to the teachers of God's word, he says, when someone rich comes into your church, don't bring them up to the front and give them pr- preferred seatings like the uh, they would do with the, um, uh, the, the different priest class within that Jewish society. You know, and then here comes a poor person and you say, hey, here's the the submissive seating. Sit there until I tell you to do otherwise. You know, he's saying you're operating in partiality because does not God choose the poor of this world to make rich? Right. He chooses the foolish of what this world system would call foolish to show his wisdom in them. And so 
Christ does not operate in partiality. If he operated in partiality, David, the great King David, would have never been chosen, right? David's older brother would have been chosen. The oldest of, of Jesse would have been chosen and not David, right? So God doesn't work in partiality, and nor should we in the church. And so that's a big do not. But I will cover that more when we get into episode three, which is the means of practical brotherly love, because that is the third essential that I see there in the church that I would like to share with you guys. In the meanwhile, I hope I've given you enough information to understand, A, that our worship is not just musical, but there's essential purposes within our worship as we gather together, and that's the praise. That's the reading of God's word. That's the giving, and that's also, too, uh, the time and location. And so hopefully this helps you as you look for a church or as you are in a church and you understand uh, the essentials uh, and the importance of you gathering in that church. Thank you for joining me, your host, Ray Garcia, on His Generation podcast this Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us at His Generation Podcast. To receive more information about the podcast, please visit our website, hisgeneration.net, or check out our YouTube channel, His Generation Podcast, for the video format of this broadcast. His Generation is a production of Generation Mars Media, located in Orange County, California.